All right, Facebook, we are live. So happy that you are here. Sorry we're a little bit late. We were having just a wonderful time of sharing this morning in our Facebook group, which tends to happen. Uh, we had a little special guest speaker and then people are logging on. It was just wonderful and a really great time. Well, as some of you know, if you've been following me on Facebook, I said this morning, I am not going to be doing the teaching. Normally, during this time of the Passover and resurrection, I share a message about that. And this year, I just felt like, you know, everybody's been hearing from me. They need to hear from somebody else. And in praying about it, I really did feel like I need to let someone else do the message. So um, Aaron Richard, who's one of the leaders and teachers in our fellowship, along with his wife, Christina, he's going to be sharing this morning. Aaron normally teaches the Torah portion. Uh, this morning, his wife taught the Torah portion, and he is going to be doing the main message this morning. So Aaron, Happy you are here with us. I will be back next week, folks. We'll start, Lord willing, again, the message on, we'll, we'll go back to our message on who's the boss as we've been doing the recap and highlighting key learning points. We'll do that next week. But for now, Aaron's going to be sharing with us. So Aaron, I am going to turn it over to you, buddy. All right. Yes, I have the pleasure of teaching this year's Passover and Recreation Day message. Now, Passover, um, you know, it's, it's one it's becoming one of my favorite holidays back you know when i was younger of course easter uh resurrection day with um you know going to church and also going to my family's house and getting the easter baskets you know gifts and my mom used to create the easter baskets with the eggs and you get the um the toys and it was like it, honestly it was like a second christmas right we just got done with christmas now it's like a second christmas because we still get gifts right but you know those are things as a child that you know as you get older you kind of you give up but um Passover. It it started this year. It started uh, Wednesday on the fifth, and then it's ending on the thirteenth. And a uh, year the 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 greeting for Passover is Hag Shema. It means uh, Happy Holidays. Now Resurrection Day, of course, is a Sunday, but also in Orthodox culture, it's like you know, like Catholics, you know, with Catholics with a lot of Orthodox Christians, it's like a month ahead of this time of you know you're, you're experiencing lent you're experiencing good friday you're experiencing the holy week there's a lot to it as well now these two holidays and when i was thinking about when i was doing this message I was thinking about these two holidays is often in our culture seen as separate one holiday easter resurrection day is seen for the christians you know who celebrate the death and resurrection of jesus the other holiday passover celebrating celebrating the redemption of the jewish people was is seen as just for the jewish people and you know that was kind of my theory as a young as a young christian i got saved as i was about maybe 20 something years old um I, you know as a young christian i would read the exodus story and i was attached to it i like the themes. I like the idea that, you know, they're in Egypt because I, for some reason, I liked Egyptian culture um, somewhat. Um, you know, I've read this story many times, but early on in my, um, my life as a Christian, I became kind of disconnected and that story kind of is disassociated um, from my life, partly because, you know, my not understanding Hebrew scripture. Um, its purpose and connection to my life. There's a lot of things in Exodus that does not make sense when you re when it's reflected upon our life. Like why would God send, I thought God loved the Jewish people, but why would he send them into Egypt and they, God's people for 400 years are slaves or they're slaves within that 400 year timeline. And it, the, the struggle that, you know, I thought God was the king of the universe. God could do whatever he wants. The struggle that, that it took for God to take Israel out of Egypt from the Pharaoh. You know, we've all seen that movie. You know, right now my kids are watching The Prince of Egypt, which is generally a good movie. I think the main theme is great, but it gives, it, the main thing gives an important, uh, important fact that God took Israel out of Egypt from a cruel leadership under pharaoh um and also the the other thing that kind of discon i in which i felt disconnected was hearing that the hebrew scripture within our modern day 
of Christianity has done away with and we just have Jesus. So when you hear that, it's like, why do we need to understand and learn the old covenant? Can we just teach the New Testament and be saved and get to heaven? But thanks to ministries like Pastor Mike, Pastor Karen, thanks to, um, you know, other scholars that they've introduced me with thanks to my father-in-law Christina's dad who's um who's friends with Mike and Karen who went to school with Mike and Karen and um who's a second century uh, a, a scholar in his own right um I, I see and understanding and reading Exodus now I see a deeper reflective comparison between the two holidays that in a sense for me you can't separate them um I see the resurrection of the Messiah the death and resurrection of the Messiah as a a direct reflection of God's Passover of the Jewish people, being that they are a transition from one state to another state. The first state, going back to the idea of, um, of going back to Passover, of slavery, going to us, you know, and resurrection of Jesus, um, death, chaos, uh, uh, idea of unproductiveness into a state of life, of order of productiveness and also of a special word that Mike, Pastor Mike introduced to me and I love flourishing, God's flourishing. Now, Passover and Resurrection Day both re represent to me a transition into a new life of, of redemption. All right, now when I speak, um, this message really kind of is going to be in three parts. The first part is going to be Passover, its background, the drama surrounding it, because I love the drama, especially studying ancient Near East. I love the drama, the conflict that you read within the story and Israel transitioning into God's people. Uh, the second part, the death and resurrection of Yeshua, Yeshua as a Passover lamb and how Yeshua's resurrection is a sign of transition into a new life. And then how then just kind of as a close, how we're supposed to live in this new state now. My favorite verse in the Bible is Exodus chapter six. Um, it's, it's really verse one through, I think, um, verse, uh, verse eight. It's, I know everybody, you know, John 316 is everybody's favorite um, Bible verse. And that's a great verse, but it's Exodus chapter six that really um, defines my life for me, right? And to kind of set the scene, as Moses returns to liberate the Jewish people, Moses and Aaron encounter Pharaoh. So they go to Pharaoh, asking him for a three-day trip to worship God, worship their God. Pharaoh telling them, why do you disturb the people from their work? Therefore, causing the burdens of the Jewish people to increase. Many within the Jewish, many of the Jewish people complain to Moses and Aaron. Moses goes to talk, goes to God, speaks with God, and as Moses finished saying, "Lord, why have you done this evil to to this people?" God answers with, and let me just turn to that. God answers with, I'm sorry. God answers with, "Now you will see what I shall do to Pharaoh, for through a strong hand he will send." Sorry. Now that now you will see what I shall do to Pharaoh through a strong hand, he will send them out. And with a strong hand, he will drive them from, uh, he will drive them from their land. So God is initiating something. God in, um, in a previous part of when God called um, Moses to become the liberator of Israel, God's, God says, and there's a, there's a verse that God says that is, uh, God remembered Israel. And it's not in a sense that God forgot about Israel, because God doesn't forget about us. God doesn't forget about our issues, our problems, our current state. He does not. But in his perfect timing, that idea of God forgets, it, we should look at it as God will enact his goal and his plan on behalf of of Israel. Um, so God commissions Moses out of his place to go back to go back to Egypt, confront Pharaoh. He returns. 
he has issues. His first initial interaction with Pharaoh causes this causes causes more burdens on Israel. Then he returns to God, say, "Hey, look, what what is going on?" And God gives him his problem promise. And this is Exodus chapter six. It says God spoke to Moses and said to him, "I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as El Shaddai, but with my name, the Lord, I will not." I did not make myself known to them. Therefore, I will establish my covenant with them and give them a land of Canaan, the land of their sojourning in which they sojourned. Moreover, I have heard the groan of the children of Israel whom Egypt enslaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, this is the kicker. Therefore, say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I shall take you out from the burdens of Egypt. I shall rescue you from their service. I shall redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgment. I shall take you to be, I shall take you to me for a people, and I shall be a God to you. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God who takes you out from the burdens of Egypt. Um, who takes you out the burdens of Egypt. To me, and I'll get to more of that later, but to me that defines who God is in his nature. There's a book called, um, there's a book called um, um, The God Who Makes Himself Known. It's by a writer named uh, W. Ross uh, Blackburn. And within this book, and I've had this book for a very long time, but started shaping the idea of the of Exodus, right? Um, going back to chapter six, it says, um, God says, I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as El Shaddai. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known. It's this idea that with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, with a patriarch, I revealed myself in a certain way. But now I will reveal myself as the redeemer, as the restorer, as the, as the God who wants a people to himself. Passover, and Passover is the key key point the key point in the story of exodus passover is a culmination to the chaos of what was before and a transition to what is to come for the jewish people ever since i started closely reading uh, or studying the ancient near east and i was introduced by the ancient near east by um pastor mike and um there's a phrase that just stuck in my mind and there's the idea um, Pastor Mike brought it up, and also a scholar named John Walton brought it up, and it, it just catches my attention and just kind of changes the idea of what 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 my life as a Christian, what 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 came before my life as a Christian um, is, and it's that word. It's a word called sacred space. In our sense, it, in, in in a sense, it's God's presence being around us and us experience God's presence. Now. Let me set the scene for all that's going on at this particular time. God, uh, sacred space is important because Adam and Eve lost sacred space in the garden by eating the fruit. Um, if you study, Pastor Mike brought this up, if you study John Walton, the idea of, um, and sorry, John Walton and other scholars, the idea of the garden was it was a temple. Adam and Eve were in there as kings and priests, and the idea of kings and priests and being God imagers. Um, um, and once they ate the garden, they were kicked out of the garden. They were kicked out of sacred space. Now, after that, humans increased chaos in the world. They were, um, their hearts turned to the evil. Um, then there was a flood. Um, then it was Noah, the story of Noah and the flood. We get to Genesis 11. A set of humans decided that they wanted to create sacred space and created the Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel is, a, is, a, is called a, a zergonaut. It's the idea that they wanted to build something to reach God, but their purpose was not to make God come down and to serve him. Their purpose was for God to serve them. So God came down, saw what's gonna happen, what was happening, came down and dispersed them. And the next very chapter, and I get this for John Walton, the scholar named John Walton, the next chapter in chapter in Genesis chapter 12, God wanted wanting to create his own sacred space. He called Abraham and his family to himself to recreate this sacred space that humans once had in the garden. Joseph, and this is why Exodus becomes so important. Joseph, so we have Abraham, his sons, 
then we get to Joseph. Joseph gets sold into Egypt and becomes a, a, a visitor, a viceroy, a um, second in command, right? Over time, Israel grew in number, but a new king rose in Egypt and forgot about Joseph. So within that 400 years, um, there's an idea that they didn't be, they weren't slaves for 400 years. Throughout the time, um, through a certain particular time, the a new king rose up. They were in fear of Israel. Um, the, this new king says, uh, let's deal shrewdly with Israel, taking taskmasters over them and enslaving them. The idea behind this was that they, this new king was afraid that Israel might partner up with the Hittite nation and that um, they, because they were having wars with the Hittites and that when Hittites came in, they were coming in through the same land with the Israelites in. So they came paired up with each other. They would just overtake Pharaoh. So Pharaoh enslaves him. Pharaoh decided to, hey, let's kill up all the males, the newborn males. Let's just end them. But Moses was born. Due to two Egyptian nurses, um, due to God's intervention, and what's key, what's key about these nurses and bless their hearts, is that the only Egyptians names, the, these two Egyptian nurses were were named. I forgot the name. I do apologize, but their names were the only Egyptian names in the Book of Exodus. That sh that tells us something, right? Um, Moses was born. His mother put him in a basket. Um, uh, put him in a basket down the river. Um, he was found by Moses, uh, the Pharaoh's daughter. He lived as an Egyptian, but at a certain time, he runs away after killing a guard, starts a new life, but is called by God to come back. He comes back to liberate Israel with Aaron, confronts Pharaoh, and after nine plagues and a very stubborn Pharaoh, God tells Moses in chapter 11, and this is where we get to the juicy part, the culmination of 400 years in Egypt, the, the culmination of their time as slaves in the land. Let me get there. It's chapter 11. God says to Moses, one more plague shall I bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. After that, I shall send you forth from there. When he sends forth, it shall be complete. He shall drive you out he shall drive you out there. Please speak in the ears of the people. Let each man request of his fellow and request of a, of a woman from your fellow, fellow silver vessels and gold vessels. The Lord granted the people favor in their eyes of Egypt. Moreover, the man of Moses was very great in the land of Egypt in the eyes of the servants of Pharaoh and in the eyes of the people. Now, the Jewish people. God is God is warning this plague, and it's the plague of the firstborn. The, the angel of death is coming in, and he's killing the firstborn. God is warning this plague and, and, and telling Israel to get ready. This is the Passover. Um, for sake of time, I'm not going to read through the whole thing. But um, in Our Father Abraham, um, a book, a really, really good book um, by Marvin Wilson, he goes through the Torah portion. First, we have the celebration um, that was to be the full moon, the first month of the spring. It's interesting because Passover, I never knew this, but Passover is all, even in the Bible, Passover is is always during the same time of the spring, the first month, the fir and the first month and the first full moon of the month, Passover happens. Um, the month is called a bib, meaning ears, later called Nisan. The, it marked the start of the barley fest. On the 10th of the month, a year old lamb or kid without defect was to be selected according to the size of the household. On the 14th of the month, at twilight between the two evenings, the land, the lamb, the lamb, the, the Passover lamb was to be killed. Blood from the lamb in a blade in a basin was to be applied by hyssop, a leafy plant, through the door frames and lintels of the house where the people gathered to eat the lamb. The lamb was to be roasted by over a fire, head, legs, and inner parts, no broken bones, bitter herbs, and bread made without yeast must be uh, must be eaten. Any part of the meal was not consumed was to be burned. The meal was to be eaten in haste. 
with cloak tucked into belt, sandals on feet, and a staff in hand. All future generations of Israelites were to celebrate Passover as a as a lasting ordinance. Um, you could go read it for yourself. Passover, the the story of Passover, it's long. It's a dramatic story. It starts from chapter eleven and ends with chapter thirteen. But I want to get to the point that in chapter fifty one it says it it happened on this day. The Lord took the children of Israel from the land of Egypt in their legions. So again, after all this time of being of being burdened with slavery, with harshness, with with all the things, when you understand Egyptian culture, it's almost like what we you know. If you've seen the Passion of the Christ, you you've seen kind of the idea of how Rome was was to to how how you know jesus was beaten um how rome was so cruel when you see other stories about about rome about um how cruel they were egypt there's some there's some deep similarities within egypt egypt didn't play egypt you know one of the things that they were in egypt is, is that they worked a lot that the jewish people i think i believe their week was 10 days within the week and they had really like half of a day to rest. The idea of um, Pharaoh not letting the Jewish people go worship their God with their cattle is interesting because they allowed other cultures and other nations and other gods in their midst. They allowed for that. But for some reason, this Pharaoh said, no, you cannot, I will not allow to, for you to worship your God with your cattle. Um, Passover, the, ex the Exodus story is dramatic and filled with ancient Near Eastern themes, which increase the drama. Um, it seems like overall, when you read this, maybe from an ancient Near Eastern mindset, when you read this or imagine you were somebody of a different culture and you're reading this story, it seems like what it seems like is a small lesser God right, of an enslaved people, a, a very large but enslaved people, utterly defeating a large nation with all of their, what we call in Christianity, their big G gods, their capital letter G gods. That's what it looks like, this small, insignificant, enslaved nation with their god that Pharaoh says, I don't know of this god, defeating what it seems like the largest nation at that time. In totality, we are seeing how, when we read the Exodus story, we are seeing how God made himself known to his people and the rest of the world. After, after, um, after 400 years, this God, this God, again, it, this story is so special because it's, it's, it's like so much of our life is in this, right? This God took Israel out of what it seems, again, the greatest nation of the time, rescued them, redeemed them with an outstretched arm and, and great judgment, and now is willing to take them as his people, and they shall be, and he shall be a God to them. That is deep. That is reflective of what Jesus does in our life today. And I'll get more to that, but just briefly, when I look at this story, when I look at the story of Passover, when I read Exodus chapter three, I am looking at a system of God use a system of what God uses to, to redeem his people, to redeem a people. In, in New Testament times, it was Israel, but it's also Jesus becomes the salvation or the, the Lamb of God, not just for the Jewish people, but for all people, the non-Jewish people. Now he's redeeming us, he's restoring us, and he's allowing us to come into his family so that he we can be a people unto him and that he can be a people unto us. Now, by out uh, by now going back to Israel by Israel obeying God throughout this whole event and again this whole event God is the hero right their status and position has changed forever they are no longer slaves in Egypt but they are now they are a people formed by God for a purpose God reveals himself 
and this this see this is key and this is a process and this i think this is a, this is god's process and i think this is something that we miss as christians when we kind of just like just read through exodus and not clearly kind of looking at what's going on when and after egypt was after um israel was saved right was redeemed out of um egypt god reveals himself to israel at mount shinai israel accepts a sign of a covenant a greater lip a greater a greater a, a god which is in the sense of the covenant a greater nation so to speak lifting up and helping a lesser nation as a lesser nation becoming a lesser nation becoming a servant unto that greater nation and this is also the god revealing himself to uh, to israel and israel accepting is also an idea of israel marrying god right god then gives them the torah teaching them how to live in this new state and then commands them to create a tabernacle again going back to my favorite word my favorite word now creating sacred space because god creates commands them to create a tabernacle god is telling them look i want to be in your midst i want to go back to the days of the garden i want to be with a people so guess what you are going to create this tabernacle so we so there could be in the middle of the tabernacle in the holies of holies there's a there's a place called the holies of holies where i will be there i will create sacred space with this people meaning his presence will be in the midst of Israel. Then sending them to the land of promise to live out this new state of flourishing, imaging God to the rest of the world and being a blessing to the rest of the world. Going back to Marvin Wilson in his book, to kind of, he paraphrases, kind of culminates Passover. It says the Exodus was the redemp was, was redemption par excellence in the life of God's covenant people. The Passover reenacted annually the greatest miracle the Lord performed out of grace of his chosen people. It was to hold central importance in the history of Jewry. The Passover celebration retold the story of freedom. Again, the Passover celebration retold the story of freedom after more than 400 years of Egyptian bondage. The pages of the Old Testament reverberate with reference to the, to the Exodus theme. All allusions to this deliverance from the tyrant awaken within each Israelite a hope for the nation's future recep re reception. When we look at Passover and how Jewish people view Passover back in the day and today, it is a theme. It is not a theme, uh, and I'm going to use this statement a lot. It is not a theme of Passover is just a date on the calendar, right? That it's just another day. No, it is. It is a spiritual awakening that remembering how God saved, and again, as a Jew, God saved my people out of slavery, right? He He redeemed them, restored them. Now we are a people who 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 follow God, who love God, a chosen people. And out of this place, since we are redeemed, we now live in a new state so that we can function and flourish according to God's commandments. When we look at why the Jewish people love God's commandments, it is that reason, because God saved them. God redeemed them. God restored them throughout all these Passover celebrations that a lot of them happen on Wednesday, uh, Wednesday but throughout all these Passover celebration, celebration, that is the theme. Now, redemptive transition is a key to understanding the Passover celebration. But God was not done. This was not the final, let's say, Passover. 400 years later, as is as Israel found himself in another state of bondage and control, this time under Rome, a prophet, the prophet John, looks up and says, "God, look." Sorry, the prophet John looks up and says, "Look, God's Lamb, the one who is taking away the sin of the world." When Israel entered into Egypt, and just going back a little bit, they were set. They they were free. When Israel went to Egypt, they were free. But Pharaoh, fearing Israel, enslaved them. But in this scenario, years later after this, 
you know, when you look at the history of Israel, they were tripping a lot. They love rebellion. They love sin, but they have come back. But at this point, under bondage and slavery, due to their Ill and, um, um, oh, disobedience and rebellion, they're, they're, they're under bond bondage of Rome. Yes, they do have the temple, but there's a lot of bad stuff going on right there. They're not free in a sense. A once free nation found themselves enslaved again. And John sees, the prophet John sees Jesus walking towards him and says, this is he who God will use not only to redeem Israel, but the rest of the world. Um, for Jewish, for Messianic Jewish believers, Passover, the redemption of the children of Israel from Egypt is a prototype of the redemption of the world which comes through Yeshua, Jesus. When we look at both holidays, right? There's this idea of, there's, there's a lot of similarities. One similarity is the lamb, the Passover lamb. We know in Passover, they were called to um, get an unblemished, uh, sacrifice an unblemished lamb, right? Without defect, perfect. Jesus, he is seen as the unblemished sacrifice, the unblemished lamb. He was perfect, sinless. But in 1 Peter 1 through 19, it, he writes, it is, it is the costly, bloody, sacrificial death of the Messiah as a lamb without defect or spot. The early Jewish people, when they're reading this story, when they're reading the story of the death and resurrection of Jesus, they're reflecting it upon Passover. Why? Jesus died during the time of Passover. I think that's key. Jesus died through the time of Passover. His, his last meal, and some scholars, well, I was reading it, some scholars debate this, but his last meal is seen as a Passover Seder. So Peter writing this, he's looking at the Messiah. He's looking at Jesus, just like John, the prophet John did, and says, this is the Passover lamb. This is the lamb that for back in the day when my forefathers were in bondage in Egypt and needed to get out, God calling them to get out. They needed to sacrifice this land. This land needed to die. This land died. This now is that same land. Blood, another thing. Pa during Passover, they were to daub hyssop with the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, doorpost of the home, doorpost of the home, so that death, the angel of death, will pass over them. That's where they get the word, pass over their house. In fact, the sacrificial meal that they were supposed to have of the lamb, that sacrificial meal was a prelude to the Exodus, was a prelude to transition from being enslaved to freedom. Jesus, Jesus, his bloodshed is a symbol of death. Us accepting that Jesus is our Lord and Savior is the symbol of death, sin, sickness, and disease passing over us. In Ephesians 1 and 7, it says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. And also we have the, the, last, the last thing I'm going to talk about is the death of the firstborn. And Passover, the, um, and, and Exodus, Passover and Exodus, it says the, the angel of death took the lives of all the firstborn in Egypt. Jesus, Jesus in the new covenant is seen as a firstborn of God. He is God's son. And dying on that cross is an image of the death of the firstborn. Now, the majority of our teaching is rooted into Jesus dying and, and rising. And that is phenomenal. That is D Jesus dying for our sins, I should say. And that is phenomenal. That, that is key point. I was listening to a lot of messages and um, it, we need those messages because we need to understand that we, be, because of our decisions, because of our attitude, sin can we can sin can corrupt us so as we transition into as we become new creations as we become believers that sin should not be a part of us part of us because it only leads to death it only leads to it's chaotic and only leads to death now again the majority of our teaching is rooted in that um 
but even deeper, the death and resurrection of Yeshua is a transition into a new life. And I get this from Pastor Mike's teaching on resurrection teaching, I think not last year, but it was a couple years ago. And I had to find this. So Pastor Mike, please, if you upload it, upload it to YouTube, find it, upload it to YouTube, because to me, it is the best message. I think we need to blast it everywhere. Um, you know, I'm always, um, always going to um, support Pastor Mike's and Pastor Karen's teaching. But in this message, I'm just going to give brief synopsis because it's a lot it's a lot of context it's a lot of studying um it's just a lot but i'm just going to briefly please go back and 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 listen to it but it's just phenomenal but pastor mike says the re the resurrection is understood from first and second century jewish people it, it the the resurrection understood from first and second century jewish people um is meant to be seen as you are one is entered into a new life into sorry the resurrection meant from a first and second century perspective is one one has entered into a whole new dimension and life and being that idea of transition the idea of entered into a whole dimension and whole life to me when i was studying this when i was listening to pastor mike just reminds me of exodus see the story of Exodus wasn't just about saving people. It wasn't. It wasn't just about God just 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 saving them people so they could be free and do whatever they want. It was about transitioning transitioning a people, a enslaved people, from slavery, from bondage, into a life of redemption. To go on, Pastor Mike says one entered into Judaism. Once, once the the idea of resurrection, you it's it's the idea of resurrection is you enter into a state of what Judaism calls the halam haba. This word is um, is um, um, the it's the coming age or the world to come, right? It's defined as the world to come or coming age. Um, again, a lot of these terms I'm not going to get in depth with because I think that uh, Pastor Mike does a great job and it took him an hour so I can't take another hour to tease his message, but it is, in a sense, another phase of God's rule and reign. Again, when he said that, another phase of God's rule and reign, it just takes me back to um, to Exodus 6 when God was explaining to Moses that for Abraham, from Isaac, for Jacob, I was this God. I was a. I, I reflected myself differently from this God, right? For, I reflected myself differently to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. But now you will see, you will see more of me. You will see more of what type of God that I am. I am the God who redeems. I am the God who restores. I am the God to get my people and 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 restore them and make them into my people so that they can flourish in this new state of being. In Jewish tradition, um, again going back, um, 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 this is something that um, this idea is this idea of a resur of, of resurrection of 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 a, of um, of uh, you know resurrection the halam haba is so, is the idea of something that is coming and something that is already here um in jewish tradition the resurrection of the dead signified the halam haba has become so this new age so as as again i'm going to lead into this but as jesus is jesus died and was resurrected it's a symbol that um to to the new covenant especially to paul that we have entered into a new age the alam haba the world to come now pastor mike brings up hosea 6 1 and 2 and hosea 6 1 and 2 reads come let us return to the lord he has torn us to pieces but he will heal us he has injured us but he will bind up our wounds after two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us that he, we may live in his presence. All right. It's a lot. Rabbinical teaching um, from, um, uh, I, I do apologize. I'll come back with the, um, with the, um, where it came from. But the, in this rabbinical teaching, it is um, 
in this rabbinical teaching, they look at this and interpret this as even in their sins, God slays, slays Israel in this world, right? So God has judgment of Israel. In this world, God judges Israel. There, there is healing for them in the world to come, the Allah Haba. There's healing for Israel. As it says, after two days, he will revive us. And on the th third day, he will restore us. Now, it's interesting because that two days and that third day, so three days, what is something that we understand what is three days? The resurrection of the Messiah. Now, the two days, two days in Hosea, in this interpretation of Hosea, the two days is the Halam Hosea, and one day is the Halam Hosea, and the Halam Hosea is this world, this current age, right? And then also the Halam Haba and the the age, of, which is which is in a sense the, the Halam Haba and the age of the Messiah, right? And then the third day, we get the true fulfillment of the halam haba the age to come the two days represent this world and the world of messiah and the understanding of the messiah is giving unto the messiah is here the messiah is living right and on the third day which is initiated by the resurrection of the dead is the halam haba now again i only gave a synopsis of what pastor mike said um his, his teaching is brilliant, but why does this matter? This matters because the new covenant views the resurrection of Yeshua as us tradition, transitioning into a, a new state and a new age. And in this age, there are certain benefits for believers to have, right? And um, again, in his teaching, Pastor Mike talks about a couple, but two, two really kind of just impress upon me. The first one is the victory over sin. Let me and now he uses. I'm just again. I'm taking it from Pastor Mike because this teaching was just phenomenal. I I I I I, I was hearing it like twice. Um, it's about an hour and twenty minutes long, but it just it is phenomenal. Now, in um, Romans six and one through chapter first fourteen, get there. We read. So then, are we to say, let's keep on sitting so that there, there can be more grace? Heaven forbid, how can we, who have died to sin, still live in it? Don't you know that to us, that don't you, don't you know that those of us who have been immersed into the Messiah Yeshua have been immersed into his death? Though immersion into his death, we were buried with him, so that as through the glory of the Father, the Messiah was raised from the dead, the resurrection raised from the dead. Likewise, we too might have new life, transition, new life, raised from the dead, new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we will also be reunited with, united with him in a resurrection like this, we now we know that our old self was to was put to death on an execution state with him so that the entire body of our sinful um sinful mind sinful um mind state might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin for someone for someone who has died um uh, someone who has died been cleared from sin now, since we died with the Messiah, we trust that he, we trust we will live with him. We will live with him. We know that the Messiah has been raised from the dead, never to die again. Death has no authority over him for his death was a unique event that need not to be repeated, but his life he keeps on living for God. In the same way, consider yourself as to be dead to sin, but alive to God by our union with the Messiah Yeshua. Therefore, do not let sin rule your mortal bodies. So this it so that it takes you. Sorry. Therefore, do not let sin. Do not let sin rule in your mortal body so that it makes you obey its des desires. And do not offer any part of yourself to sin in an instrument of, of wickedness, 
On the contrary, you, you uh, offer yourself to God as people alive uh, from the dead, as your various parts to God's as instruments for righteousness. For sin will not have authority over you because you are under you are not under legalism, but under grace. Um, due to the death, the resurrection of the Messiah, the new state, this new state that we, this new reality that we live in and live in, sin is no longer, sin no longer has any reign over us. This state, this, the, the, the purpose of the resurrection of Yeshua trans, helps us, trans, transitions us out of a state of chaos and rebellion. Because what is sin? Think about what happens in the um, right before. Um, think about what happens what happened with the um, the Israel um, with the golden calf. They were they they were established as a nation, but for some reason, they leave themselves fearing that Moses is not going to come back. They replace Moses with this golden calf, and sin just abounds in this midst. And then God comes punishing those who were led by this by this sin. Think about what happens to us now. Sin, we, we're, we're believers, we're faithful. Then all of a sudden, we let a little sin in. We let a little, we let a little, little watching of a movie, and now we're addicted. Now we're addicted to um, to porn. We let um, we 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 smoke one joint, and then now we're addicted to drugs. We cuss a little bit, and now we're cussing like say <laughs> like sailors. Um, we let a little lie slip and now we're lying to everybody else. Um, we steal a little money, but now we're stealing from everybody, from, from everybody that we came from sin, a little bit of sin. And the new Testament talks about this in a sense of, uh, um, sin of leaven, uh, or yeast, sorry, a little bit of sin causes so much chaos within our community, causes so much rebellion within our community. But now but now, because we are in this transition, this state, this state of resurrection, of resurrected life, because of the death of Yeshua, now we're being set free from the power and burden of sin. That is the image of, of God redeeming Israel out of Egypt, that, that no longer having to be in the rule and in the framework and in the presence of that burden, of that slavery. See, sin truly is a worse slave than Egypt was to Israel because our sin is kind of caused, you know, it's us, right? Uh, when we sin, we, we not only hurt ourselves, we, we, let in, we let in sin, we're hurting ourselves, but we also hurting, the, hurting our, our relationship with God and our relationship with other people. But again, because of this state, sin no longer has any power or burden over our lives. The second thing he brings up, Pastor Mike brings up, is the spirit of God. In Romans 8 and 9, this won't be long, promise. In Romans 8 and 9, it reads, um, 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 but you who don't identify with your old nature, but with the spirit, provided the spirit of God is living inside of you. For anyone who does not have the spirit of the Messiah does not belong to him. However, if the Messiah is in you, then on one hand, the body is dead because of sin. But on the other hand, the spirit is giving life because God considers you righteous. God considers you righteous. And if the spirit of the one who raised Yeshua from the dead is living in you, then the one who raised the Messiah Yeshua from the dead it will also give you life to the mortal bodies through his spirit living in you. Um, phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal thing that Paul says. The spirit, the, the giving of God's spirit, of God's spirit to me is a sign that is another sign that we moved into another dimension. But 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 when I'm looking at what's happening, Exodus, right? When I'm looking at the spirit is the idea of God's presence. There's a connection. There's a connection to this passage. There's a connection of Jesus dying, resurrecting, and then later on giving, the giving of his, the giving of God's spirit on the Jewish people, right? There's a connection. 
this the spirit as a reflection their spirit is a reflection of god's presence on us right and as as believers we are god's temples now this to me is an image of god again recreating sacred space that idea that when god told in exodus that told after the passover told each told israel that he wanted them to create to help create a tabernacle so his presence will his presence will be among israel that in the holies of holies it is it is his sacred place that god's presence will be among israel blessing them and connecting with them and dwelling with israel that we in this life have the same have the same because we are god's temple and 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 with with the idea of god's temple we have god's presence god's spirit on us these two, uh, I mean, that that is just amazing. The, to me, that is phenomenal that when we get when we get these themes in a new covenant of like, why did Jesus die? And then why did he die? He, he came back, then he went up and he said, you know, hey, look, I can't stay longer, but my comforter, my my the spirit, God's spirit would be on us. It's like, no, Jesus, we want you. Like, why can't you just stay here and just be among us, right? It's like, no. God's spirit is among us. We are, as, as believers in the Messiah, we are created, we are sacred space for God, not just for ourselves, but for, for people on this earth. And I love how before when um before this message we were having um our, our Pastor Karen was talking about hope, that this world needs hope we are believers not just for god to bless us god's presence just to be upon us but we are believers to give the presence of god's hope the reality of, of who god is um these two i'm gonna close right here but these two holidays are a reflection of what god tells moses in exodus that god's redemption god's redemption has the power to restore us back to himself so that we can be his people um, um paul writes in second corinthians 5 4, uh, 14 and 19 i'm not gonna go through it but he uses transitioning language one man died yeshua so from now on we as we are new creations and again, and, and the last thing, not counting their sins against them. Transition. We have transitioned from the life of sin and death and chaos, right? That bondage and symbol and symbolism of the Passover, of being bondage under uh, under Egypt. And then now we're in this, we're in this new life as new creations new forms of ourselves the idea when you know when we talk about it, the the idea of holiness comes to mind because when we talk about holiness it's not just a like a, a state that we kind of climb to we're forever uh, trying to increase our holiness with god we're forever trying to e increase our dwelling with god um we're forever trying to with our holy with our holiness function in the way that god has us functionist fun functioning um 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 simply put the the us being in this new realm and us understanding that sin is has no part of this new creation has no part of this realm we should not live from a old state of chaos and of flourishing remember when Egypt or when Israel was was saved, restored, um, they were out of the land of Egypt, heading to the land of promise. How many times did a, a people and people of the people of Israel go to Moses and say, "Hey, we want to go back. We want to go back to the old state." We want to go back to Egypt because we missed the leaks and we missed the this and the that and the that and the that and then that. And it's like, wait a minute. You cannot flourish in this new state with the idea of the old state. That that just that just can't be. In First Corinthians, um, Paul writes, uh, let me turn there. And I'm almost done. I first Corinthians five. Uh, 
five, six says, your boasting is not good. Paul writes, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that saying it is always, sorry, your boasting is not good. Don't you know the saying, it takes only a little hamat leaven, ye, sorry, yeast to leaven the whole bunch, the whole batch of dough. Get rid of the old hamas, the old life, the, the, it's, it's, Hamatz, Hamatz is yeast. It's a Jewish word for yeast. But get rid of the old, your old life so that you can be a new batch of dough because in reality, you are, you are unleavened. For our Passover lamb, the Messiah, Yeshua, has been sacrificed. Sacrificed, right? So again, get rid of the old Hamatz. Get rid of the old life so that you can be a new batch of dough because in reality, you are unleavened. Sin is not a part of our life. Sin is nowhere part of our life. We no look, we, we, this holiday is so impactful because we no longer look, I, I will no longer look at this holiday as a moment on a biblical calendar, right? These two holidays prove something for me. They're, they're static, they're moving, they're vibrant, they're, they're vibrant. One, it's remembering and experiencing the original Passover. Two, it's remembering and experiencing the death and resurrection of Yeshua. Three, it's remembering my own salvation, where I came from, that old life. Yeah, maybe I wasn't too bad, but if I kept up what I was doing, I would not be in the position that I am right now in my life married with kids um um uh, knowing so much about the lord no, knowing pastor mike and pastor karen knowing all of you um i i am here because i i chose to live this life i transitioned out of my own self into this new life into this new reality i'm a new creation and god has blessed me so so much then also uh living us living in this new state, understanding that I am God's temple, his presence is in me, I am, I am in a sense sacred space, that I am to remain in this new state, the old, the hummets, the old leaven, anything sin is not a part of my new life, even though I may do it, I move past it, I've, I've asked for forgiveness, I move past it, and, and change so that 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 sin is not a part of my life that i experience god's flourishing and blessing on my life and and the key thing here about why that we are christians and why that we live in this new state it is not just because it is not just to experience god's flourishing in our own life but it is to help others experience god's flourishing and and be a blessing in this world again going back pastor karen talked about hope hope we are Jesus. Is, you know, we talk all the time. Jesus is the hope of this world. A lot of pastors are going to talk tomorrow about Jesus being Jesus is dying for our sins, and He is the hope for this world. But guess what? You also are to the hope of this world because we now live in this reality, uh, this resurrected reality. That again, because the power of Jesus' death and resurrection, now. We are called, we are redeemed, restored, and called unto him. He empowers us by his spirit and his presence to be a blessing to others, that others can experience God's flooring, that others can experience getting out of their own Passover, their, their own, sorry, their own bondage, their own exodus, that others can have their own exodus in their life, beginning with that out of, of whatever bondage that, that they're in. Two things that I'm, I promise you I'm done. Rabbi Sachs, he's a um, he's a rabbi that recently died. He died last year, but he he's he spoke of a message. He spoke on Passover, and he had this idea. He said, "I can imagine myself talking to Pharaoh, right? Going back and taking taking a time machine, going back and and talking to Pharaoh, right? And he says, this is what I'll say to Pharaoh. It's like Pharaoh, look, let me tell you about what happens in the future." I see this, you know, he sees this, he sees what Pharaoh created, this immersive and massive, this immersive and massive kingdom, right? It's, it's, he, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, the Pharaohs of ancient Egypt created this massive kingdom. Now, again, the Pharaoh's thought, and this is what his comment to Pharaoh, 
It's like, Pharaoh, you think that your kingdom will last forever and ever and ever. Same thing with Rome. They think that their, their kingdom will last forever and ever and ever. But what Rabbi Sachs says that's so profound, he says, your kingdom does not last. What lasts is, was the people that God redeemed and restored and set to become his people again. What lasted was God was the people that got redeemed god restored and set to become his people that thing that egypt thought that was insignificant that thing that egypt wanted to enslave and burn that's the thing that lasts lasts forever and ever and what continues to last because of the resurrection the death and the resurrection of the messiah is that through yeshua both Jew and Gentile together are a people whom God redeemed, restored, and set to become his people. It's not because of Yeshua, it's not just Israel. It's you and me. It's the non-Jews. It's people around this world being the people of God, flourishing because God's presence is on them, but also helping and blessing the rest of the world. Again, going back to the idea of hope, providing hope hope, providing God redemption, restoration, and is setting people up to be God's, God's people. The last thing, um, Rick, my uh, father-in-law, uh, brung up this teaching a long time ago. And um, I, it's, 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 in this teaching, it's about like probably 10 years old. He just does something amazing. And he, he calls it the challenge. And I'm just going to read it. It's about 11 things that Christians should do. Um, number one, we should live as we should live as if the Bible were completely true. Number two, we determine to love according to God's word, despite how other profession, professing Christians live. Number three, we decide to believe and act on every promise, every commandment, and every warning in the Bible. Number four, we decide to be living witness to this generation. Number five, we decide to do whatever was necessary to be a true follower of Jesus. Number six, we are determined to live as Christians at all times. Number seven, we follow, we allow ourselves to be open and transparent to one another. Number eight, we let our guards down and allow other brothers and sisters in the Messiah to hold us accountable. Number nine, we, we really open our hearts to love God completely and love others truly. Number 10, we live out the greatest commandment, love God with all of our heart, soul, and strength, and love others as ourselves. And number 11, we love we love one another and forgave everyone who has wronged or hurt us. When we do this, when we do this, we will change the world. That's my teaching people. Um, I think that, um, again, just to go back, I think like Passover and, the death, and the death and resurrection of Yeshua are parallel, the comparisons, they teach of transitioning us out of an old, um, of a slavery bondage life into a life of redemption. And with that redemption, we have so much. We have victory over sin. We have, we have the spirit. We have hope. We have healing. We have freedom. We have so much when we accept. And in, in this state now, when we accept the death and resurrection of Yeshua, and he is our salvation, we make him our salvation. We cleave onto him and we become his people. We follow him. We live out his commandments. And then God's presence is on us. We flourish with God's presence. And then we bless and help other people flourish. We can change this world for the better. God commands us to do this, and God wants us to do this. Amen. This teaching will be um, after this teaching will be on um, will be uploaded to YouTube um, at the um, Keep It in Context um, YouTube um, page. Please promote it, share it, um, especially Pastor Mike and Pastor Karen's teaching. Promote them. I think. I mean, I I just think the world of them. 
They are awesome. And they're one of the reasons why I, the, I teach the way I teach. And I know this God. I, I know the God of the Bible is because of them and also my father-in-law. Amen.